Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. How are we doing today? We have a little bit of a book review today. But before we go into the book review, I got to give you my sales pitch, right? Seven day free trial, always an athlete team. If you guys want to join, check it out. Team trial will be in the show notes. We are in the middle of a sweet upper body hypertrophy slash power phase, moving into more hypertrophy. Lower body, we are in a strict power phase. It's going to be actually a fun phase um, because I like power training, you know. I like to run and jump and be explosive. But we also have then on Wednesdays a flex day, which is where we uh, maintain some of our bilateral strength we've built up before. So you guys can check it out. Seven day free trial. People like the team a lot. You might like it too. Remember, it's a free trial. So give it a go. Well, so today I get my, my book right here. You guys can't see if you're not watching this. It's called Creative Confidence. I've actually read this book in the past. And I really liked it. And then I gave it away to a friend. I think I gave it away. Or I lost it. I probably give, I give books away quite a bit. I have a really bad habit of doing that, especially books that are not too expensive. Some books are kind of expensive and I don't give those away. And this one's like 15 bucks or 10 bucks. So I might have given it away. Um, but it's an awesome book. And it was a book I recommend all my interns to read um, because it helps you create confidence in your ability to be creative. I know that sounds kind of corny almost. Like, well, what the heck does that mean? I think a lot of people in the book points it out too. We uh, we hold back our creativity. I would say I don't want to say hinder it or limit it or whatever you want to say, but we get put down. We um we kind of stop being creative as we get older. And I've mentioned that on the podcast here. In a world where we engage with others, being creative is so important. Whether it's creative and how you write a resume, creative and how you interact with people, how you observe. New ideas um, are awesome. And it's not new ideas in the sense of, oh, I'm going to make a new product that's going to change the world. It might be something very small, a low-hanging fruit that's in front of you that you can do. And for those of you interested in social media and wanting to get started there, this is also awesome for you. Um, lots of great examples throughout the book. Lots of um, actual takeaway information. I'll talk about some of that here. And then some also workshop little things in the back, which is really cool too, because you can put your... Uh, creativity to the test because you know a lot of these books sometimes they just give you you know a little bit of information in the first 10 pages and then you're like well i could have done without the other 250 pages but this one the whole time very useful so it's written by tom kelly and david kelly they work at the design school at stanford and the book is just a fun little read and i want to dive into some actually key takeaways and one of the things I found really interesting that I found useful, and let's kind of dive into a couple of these here, page 74 and 75, for those of you following along at home, which you probably not, but it's about cultivating a creative spark. And so I'll read some of the bits from the page. Um, and then it had eight takeaways that I thought were really useful. And I'll walk through each of the eight with you, and maybe you can find some utility from them as well. So first and foremost, number one is choose creativity. To be more creative, the first step is to decide you want to make it happen, right? If you want to be creative, you need to actually take the steps to be creative. You cannot be passive and cannot just assume that someone else is uh, more creative than you just because they appear that way and then you deny your own creativity. Creativity is a choice. Um, and this is really true. <laughs> you run into people all the time who are very creative people. Who don't think they can be creative and being creative, just like being engaged um, in class or actually reading a book, it just takes a little bit of effort. So choose creativity. And again, creativity is that large word. I think people think in their head creative means I'm drawing colorful shoes or I can make clothing or whatever. No, something as creative as, oh, this one exercise modified this way is really useful or um this aspect in a resume that's really useful. When I talk to someone, I get more information out of them when I ask these qu these questions. And those are creative means. So that's number one. Number two, think like a traveler. Like a visitor to a foreign land, try turning fresh eyes on your surroundings, no matter how mundane or familiar. Don't wait around for a spark to magically appear. Expose yourself to new ideas and experiences. So while number one is the mindset of choosing creativity, Number two is beginning to put yourself in situations where you expose yourself to novel things. Go on social media. Look at pages that you don't follow. 
Look at food pages. Look at, um, my gosh, it's a huge reservoir of creativity on there. Look at people who are influencers in a different genre, clothing, makeup. I don't care what it is. Take away what you can take away. Put yourself in situations to be exposed to things. Go to seminars. Go to classes. Meet with people. Put yourself in situations that give you a higher probability of being exposed to something that you haven't been. So think like a traveler. That's number two. Number three, engage, relaxed attention. Flashes of insight often come when your mind is relaxed and not focused on completing a specific task, allowing the mind to make new connections between seemingly unrelated ideas. This is awesome because it's a counterbalance kind of the first two. I think people say, I'm going to be creative. And they want to be creative. They have the idea of being creative. Then they make creativity a task. They make it too much of a science and not enough of an art. So they go to new places. They might expose themselves to new things and they become fixated versus realizing that there is some spontaneity to creativity. Engaged, relaxed attention, being hyper attentive over the top about certain things will take away from your ability to be exposed to things because you get so fixated on a task. But then you be then you build an assumption model. And this assumption model is something that you know you assume this is the best way to do it. That it builds a framework that almost walls off certain areas of creativity. Number four, empathize, empathize with your end user. You come up with more innovative ideas when you better understand the needs and context of people you're creating solutions for. Know your customer. Know who you're talking to. If it's an interview, what are things that that person is looking for? Empathize with their needs. Not just going and saying, these are my strengths, but your strengths are only relative to their weaknesses or their needs. Product market fit. Understand that you are providing a product but that product only fits within a specific kind of market. And that market is determined by the end user. So that's number four, which is empathize with your end user. Five, do observations in the field. If you observe, or if you observe others with the skills of an anthropologist, you might discover new opportunities hidden in plain sight. Low-hanging fruit. You don't need to go all over the world to uncover things that are useful. Just be an observant. And that ties back into number one, that you're choosing creativity. And they're not like the switch where, oh, now I'm going to be creative. Now I want to learn. You're, you're always being creative in the sense that it's something going around in the background, right? And that number three was that engaged, relaxed attention. So you're not sitting there making this, this all out switch you've applied and you're going creative mode to the nth degree. And it actually gets in the way of your creativity. Instead, you are having this thing running in the background. And in that, when you observe something, whether you're going to the grocery store or whether you intentionally go somewhere, you have the ability to take away information. Number six, ask questions starting with why. <laughs> Little kids do this all the time. A series of why questions can brush past surface details and get to the heart of the matter. Are you going to make a strength coach mad? Just keep asking why they do certain things in their program. Sometimes they get to a point where they can't justify it. For example, if you ask someone why they're still using a fading technology, think landmine phones, the answer might have more to do with psychology than practicality. That's really important as well. Why are you making a resume? Why are you doing this for your consumer? The why aspect ties back in to those specific uh, consumers. So why, why, why? As you start to note, by the way, all these kind of topics are synergistically working together. Reframe challenges. Number seven, sometimes the first step towards a great solution is to reframe the question. Starting from a different point of view uh, can help you get the essence of a problem. That's an awesome one. I love the reframing of a question because I talk about this quite a bit with my athletes. What is the definition of success? What is the definition of a good shot? This is an argument I got in quite a bit with basketball. My coach would say, take a better shot. Well, a good shot is relative to the other shots and opportunities. A good shot, a bad shot for one athlete might be a good shot for another athlete. Reframe the question. A good shot and bad shots contextual. It's based on a percentage of likelihood going in. A good post or a bad post on social media might be defined by the type of engagement, the magnitude of engagement, the totality of engagement. Yeah, I can make a post that gets 100 
200,000 views, but is that really portraying the message I want to get across? Number, uh, number eight, last one, build a creative support network. And this is like something I you don't really see, <laughs> but you would like to more, is the collaboration. And the collaboration of people trying to be creative. And too often our networks that we interact in on social media aren't actually networks of friends and people we enjoy per se. <laughs> They're like uh, competitors, colleagues and competitors who all strive to fight for the same attention. And they'll rather put you down than help you. So building a network of people is a really cool idea from which you have a collaboration network. People who are actually working together, sharing ideas, sharing posts, sharing concepts of things that work, promoting each other encouraging each other all those things i think are are awesome options and in, in that in those means um and then the application of those it might be you know one of the eight might be more important for you than the other um and so i'll review those eight as i just turn the page of my book so let me balance this microphone really quick because let's go into another page i wanted to talk about but let me just go over those eight really quick again no we're not going to talk about each one let's remind you of them so number one choose creativity Number two, think like a traveler. Three, engage, relax, attention. Four, empathize with your end user. Five, do observation in the field. Six, ask questions starting with why. Seven, reframe challenges. And eight, build a creative support network. So on the back of the book or the end of the book, they also have applications and training methods you can do. This is page 212. And this is a creativity challenge. And I actually did this one the other day and I really enjoyed it. It's push yourself to think divergently and creative. Actively engage in exercises that foster divergent or unconventional thinking can encourage the generation of ideas. When you're searching for innovation, solutions, or your own mind maps, your own mind maps can be a powerful way to come up with ideas to gain clarity about a topic. Uh, they are extremely versatile, and we use them all the time. We're coming up with ideas for a family vacation to identify and home projects to tackle over the weekend. Mind maps can be used for all sorts of problem solving. They help you chart the recesses of your mind surrounding one central idea. The further you can, uh, the further you get from the center of the map, the better, the more hidden ideas you uncover. Essentially, you take an idea, you put it in the center of the piece of paper, and you draw a network around it of related ideas from it. And what you begin to realize is your ideas are typically quite superficial. And when you dive into your ideas, you start to understand the why of them. You start to have uh, see networks and connections. You start to see things that are useful. I like to keep track of notes and then try and add notes to these connections. So if I go on social media and I see something that I like, or I see someone who's doing something really well, I might go, oh, well, hmm, I would like to add that into my stuff. So I'm gonna keep a note up top here in the top right as I talk about my, you know, um, let me have an example. It's kind of confusing. I say social media posts might be in the middle. On the top right, I might then have some ideas of social media posts I like, but I won't add them in right away to the map. I'll begin outlining the maps, like infographic video, things like that, talking with text and so on. And I begin to elaborate out. And then I start to see where those things I like fit into the grand picture. And then when I have that, I can see how it might work for me. You can do this same concept with research and science. You can say movement. You can say uh, speed strength. I don't care what it is, getting stronger. And you begin to outline this network. And on the top right, you might have some specific notes that you yourself have written in that you want to find the connections. And so as you walk through this, you begin to add connections into it. So in the book as well, it's... Go read the book. It had covered like two pages of whatever, 270 or something. It's awesome. But one of the things it talks about is finding hours of inspiration. Now, it doesn't say that directly, but that's how I define it. I think we as people are creative at certain times more so than others. And finding those times when you're creative is really important. But guess what? You might have a job. You might be doing something where during your hour of creativity, you're doing something else. So keep a notebook with you. Keep a notepad with you. Take the time to jot down those ideas. And when you do something like that, you begin to aggregate information because a lot of times, we don't forget the idea. We forget the inspiration of the idea. I think that's really important. So like if you have an idea, you might think of it later in the day, like, oh, yeah, you know, I remember I want to do this or that. But you don't recall the inspiration that those steps that got you there. So when you write down an idea, write down around the idea, some of the things that inspire it, some keywords. That way you have context to your idea because you want to get back into that state and access that, you know, closet of information 
that contains more than just an idea, but a whole wardrobe. And look at that analogy right there, right? It's not just in a shirt, it's the whole wardrobe of the idea. So you can understand where it connected from, and then you can kind of get back into it. So again, I, hours of inspiration, because there might be certain times when you have that, and then utility of writing down ideas or notebooks, put it on your phone, take a picture of it, um, a voice memo. Voice memos are really underrated. I don't do that enough. I feel like I'm a crazy person. I'm just in public writing a voice memo. Dear Max, I was inspired today when I was on. It's kind of what I feel like if you guys have ever seen the movie, uh, The Core, and the, the guy, the scientist at the end who has the voice memo, he's like, they go to the center of the earth and he's like doing the voice memo, but he's going to, you know, get blown up in the core of the earth. And he's like, why am I doing this? Not to get off the tr track at all, you know, random tangent. Um, but yeah, have a voice memo or have some context. You're all really useful. Um, all in all, Creative Confidence is an awesome book. It's one of many books I enjoy. I know I mentioned I'll be doing more book reviews and book club-like things, and we are going to do those, I promise. Depending on the type of book, I do have the lean startup. I've been taking notes on it. I might go chapter to chapter with that one because that one, it's a little different than Creative Confidence. Creative Confidence seems to be an internal one where you read it, and a lot of it's about yourself exploring it. Maybe we'll come back to it, and I'll share some more ideas on what I've taken away from it, how I've used it, um, some information I have created or thought about creating. And maybe we can kind of create that social creative network on here. Where we're all kind of working together. Um, obviously, it's just me speaking, but maybe in the future, we can get someone on here on the Zoom or whatever, and we can talk about how we can work through some creative concepts and ideas. I think that'd be really cool for people to hear. And just so we can have, uh, you know, as a listener, you can get some ideas going as well. I want to make this fun and engaging more so than just, you know, a regular old fashioned strength podcast. I want this something more. So as always, thank you for listening. I appreciate you guys. As always, I hope you guys enjoy. Take care. I appreciate y'all and peace out.